we'll get started. Um, thank you for joining us today for the PNAMP IMW Forum. If we haven't met, my name is Amy Poles. I work for the USGS and the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership, or PNAMP for short, uh, and I am the staff lead for the PNAMP IMW Forum. Uh, as you may have noticed or just heard me say, we're recording today's meeting. We do plan to post the recording to the PNAMP YouTube channel, uh, but we will be editing out the discussions. Okay, got my mouse back. Um, so just uh, a few tips before we dive into the agenda. Um, so just uh, reminders for navigating the Teams meeting platform. Please make sure you're muted when you're not speaking. If you're on the phone, you can use star six to mute and unmute yourself. And if you're using your computer for audio, you can use the microphone icon on the toolbar. And as much as I love seeing everyone, um, it will help teams run more smoothly uh, if everyone keeps their cameras off when they're not speaking. Uh, we invite you to use the chat at any time, uh, but we also encourage you to ask questions and provide feedback out loud. And using the icon on the toolbar, we'll call on you to unmute yourself. Uh, and if you're on the phone, you're just gonna have to do your best to jump in when there's a pause. So I'm really excited about today's meeting. Uh, it's been almost two years. I think it was November of 2020 when uh, Amelia and John reached out to PNAMP uh, with the idea of synthesizing management implications from IMW work to date. Um, a lot of time and effort uh, from IMW PIs, from John, Amelia, Bob, um, and others went into the synthesis report. And we're just really excited to share the highlights from this work with the broader IMW community. Uh, so in a minute, we will do introductions using the chat. I'll talk briefly about today's purpose. We'll review the synthesis report purpose, process, and results. We'll have time for Q&A. Uh, the second half of the meeting is going to focus on the report's recommendations, uh, the results from the recent survey. And we're going to seek your feedback on what you think uh, the priorities are for future collaborative work. Uh, we'll wrap up with next steps. <clears throat> and then we wanted to make sure that we had lots of time for questions and discussion. So we've allotted three hours for the meeting, um, but it's going to be much shorter if you guys are quiet. Uh, but if the group is talkative, and we hope that you are, uh, we'll plan to take a break about an hour or an hour and a half in. All right, so today I have Amelia, Bob, and John helping with meeting facilitation, and they will introduce themselves at the start of their sections. And then as always, we're looking forward to hearing from you with your questions and feedback. All right, so before we dive in, um, I invite you all to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, let, us your, let us know your name and affiliation. And I'm gonna head over there to see who we have. Again, to find the chat, you go to the toolbar. And for depending on whether you're using the browser or the desktop app, that navigation bar toolbar might be at the top right or it might be in the middle of your screen if you like hover your mouse. And then the little chat bubble will open up the chat for you. I'm seeing introductions roll in. Lots of familiar names. Right. All right, well, um, I'm glad you're all here. And while uh, folks finish uh, up introducing themselves, I'm gonna just briefly remind you what it is that we're trying to accomplish today. I can get my screen to advance, there we go. Um, so first, uh, we want to share highlights from the report. And so my coworker, Meg, is gonna drop a link to the report into the chat right now. Um, Hopefully you've had a chance to read it, but if not, um, now you've got direct access to it. Uh, and as you'll see, there's a lot more detail in the report than we're gonna share in slides today. Um, and there may be times that you'll want to refer to the report, 
There's some slides later on that are packed with information and the font might get a little small. So um, having that report handy uh, will be a good thing. Uh, second, we want to discuss priorities for future research opportunities that were identified in the report and think about who can help advance these topics. And third, we want to discuss the report's uh, recommended actions and get your feedback on what you think, uh, what would be best suited for a winter or spring PNAMP IMW workshop. All right, so those are the kind of the three main uh, objectives for today's meeting. Are there any questions before we move on? Okay. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to John and Amelia to cover a little bit of background on why we decided to undertake the synthesis and how. Thanks, Amy. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Well, hi, everyone. Um, this is John Foltz. I'm director of the Snake River Salmon Recovery Board in southeastern Washington. I uh, know many of you on the call and uh, some of you I don't, so it's, it's nice to uh, have everyone here today. Um, so why did we get involved in this? Uh, I was, to be honest, hoping that uh, we could put forth this project and have some other folks carry it forward. I guess it's one of those cases of be careful what you wish for and somehow got involved in the development of this. But I, I did want to say um, that the report is done and I wanted to thank everyone for their help on that. It was it was a, I think, much bigger effort than we had originally envisioned. Um, but um, a lot of great input, you know, the IMWPIs and those working on those projects, a huge thanks um, through the review and the development of the report. But now we'd like to make use of it and carry carry this effort forward. You know, where did we start with this? You know, there's um, from a regional recovery perspective, you know, we need all the help and insight we can get to make progress towards recovery. And we're relying on the IMWs to help answer and inform the question, are habitat restoration efforts successful at generating the desired fish population response? And, you know, we developed, as we started this project, we developed kind of this guiding question here that you see on the screen that relates to that. And in every, every part of this report, it was just, you know, how are we advancing this? How are the IMWs resulting in tangible, implementable restoration and management recommendations um, that improve fish production resiliency or, or survival? And there's many different audiences for this, you know, for funders, is restoration working? For restoration practitioners and planners, you know, how can we apply what we're learning um, and improve our work and achieve the desired fish response? You know, and to a lesser extent, I think for research scientists and monitoring professionals, you know, sharing lessons learned. And, you know, the IMWs are an ongoing effort. There's lots of information and reports out there on what's been done and, and information to date. It hasn't necessarily been transitioned into, you know, out applying it, or at least that information wasn't broadly shared. And so that was kind of the impetus for, for this effort. If you could hit the next slide, Amy, for me, thanks. Thanks, Amy. So um, again, you know, back to more of the why, you know, this was as much an outreach and communication effort as anything. Um, we wanted to acquire and engage the broader IMW community to acquire feedback to frame future work and needs and tee up future direction. Um, there were there's lots of conversations all the time that revolve around funding and, and capacity support. We wanted to show the value and relevance for future funding decisions. I'm, um involved in our regional imw and, and know there's lots of great work there and wanted to kind of to report that out and we had a pilot um management implications and applications workshop just in our region with the asotan imw and, and thought it worked pretty well and wanted to expand that and we originally were hoping i think to kind of go imw by imw and talk about what we've learned you know, not everything is statistically significant and publishable. It's not that it's not important, but 
Um, maybe there's there's lessons learned that we can share in more of an informal forum. Um, we didn't have the resources or time to go IMW by IMW, which is why, you know, for better or worse, we ended up doing kind of a collaborative Pacific Northwest wide um, conversation and reports. Um, and so we, you know, we we dug into that and, and folks had questions, you know, how is this going to be used? There's always some discomfort in sharing unpublished data or or um, information that that might not be publishable, you know. So how are we going to use this? And and it really was this outreach and information sharing tool. You know, we wanted to share it with with those implementing recovery plans, uh, funders, you know, policymakers, uh, habitat restoration project implementers, you know, folks that would be able to use this and and use it in their everyday work and we also wanted to highlight some of the data gaps to move it forward and inform future research questions and um, as the imws move forward you know these are not done this is not a comprehensive report of the work done to date there will be there will be more on on what the imws are learning and their analysis in the future um, but just to check in and you know if there's an opportunity to help guide where where IMWs go as they analyze data collected or if there are other questions we should be considering, um, we, we should make a light of that. Uh, if you could hit the next slide, Amy. I'm going to hand it over to Amelia to talk a little bit about the how we did this. Thanks, John. And for those that don't know me, I'm Amelia Johnson. I'm based in Southwest Washington, a science coordinator with the Lower Columbia Fish Recovery Board. And for whatever reason, my um, uh, Teams isn't showing the messaging, the chat side. So if someone asks the question in the chat, I'll just rely on one of the other facilitators to bring it up and I'll, I'll try to answer any questions. So like John mentioned with the process of this report, it was really important for us that it was presenting the collective messaging from all the IMWs in Pacific Northwest. Um, so we created a pretty iterative process. Um, it was really important to us that the messaging on the lessons learned and fish and habitat results from the individual IMWs really came from the monitoring teams. We did our best to um, have a lot of listening opportunities and a lot of review of language so we can make sure that we were presenting it the most accurately that we could. Last summer, we sent out a questionnaire to the different IMW monitoring teams across the Pacific Northwest. We ended up getting responses from 13 different IMWs. The questions were really focused on uh, results to date in terms of fish and habitat monitoring, any conclusions or patterns that folks were observing in the different watersheds, the potential applicability of the results to other systems, um, and what they were learning in terms of implementing different restoration treatments, working with landowners, working with policy folks and other stakeholders in their in their systems. And so we use this information to draft what we ended up calling core messages, which are essentially take home messages focused on fish and habitat results and coordination and management aspects of implementing these different IMWs. And we hosted three different workshops last winter um, to really discuss and fine tune and finalize these different messages from across the IMWs. These don't necessarily represent all IMWs. Um, there's examples in the report from specific IMWs linked to each individual core message, but it was more the collective messaging that we were getting from our conversations with the monitoring folks, as well as the survey information. Uh, John, Bob, Amy and I used this information to draft a report back in February, and then through the spring, we worked on revisions to that report. Um, with the different IMW stakeholders. And that report is now published on the PNAP website, which I believe is linked through the chat. Uh, next slide, please. Our goal with the report is that it doesn't just sit on a shelf or on PNAP's website, but it's actually being read and used across um, restoration programs in the Pacific Northwest. These are some of the examples that we know of already. If you know of other examples where you've already been applying information from the report, we'd love to hear it. Um, back in April, Bob did, April and June, Bob did some presentations um, on the fish and habitat results specifically at the Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference and then to the Washington Salmon Recovery Funding Board to inform their funding decisions related to the Washington-based IMWs. Um, it was also brought up in conversations with the Columbia Basin Collaborative while they were discussing the importance of considering all age threats to salmon and steelhead in the basin. 
And then there are summaries of the report published in the Columbia Basin Bulletin, and then more recently, the CLC Currents Magazine. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing a story map that we've been working on with Washington Governor Sam Recovery Office for their 2022 State of the Sam Report. That should come out, I believe, in December. And then Bob is working um, through GSRO in Washington with the five Washington-based IMWs to do some meta-analysis. So we use the existing data from the individual IMWs with a special focus on the three Western Washington systems to answer some more research questions. Um, and some of these align pretty well with the uh, research opportunities that are in the report itself. Next slide, please. OK, so I'm going to turn it over to um, Bob to talk about the results. Hey, thanks, Amelia. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, OK. Yeah, I can. Uh, I'm going to go over the, the efficient habitat responses that we, we uh, <clears throat> they were reported in the synthesis here pretty quickly. But let me preface this by emphasizing a point that both John and Amelia have, have already made, and that is that what we're doing here is taking sort of a snapshot of IMWs that are in the process of, of collecting their data and analyzing their data. That none of the IMWs, I think with the exception of one, is actually a completed project. These are all works in progress and what we're doing is simply trying to pull together some information about the results they're seeing to date. So a lot of this stuff that we're reporting here may in fact change somewhat as these studies continue. So again, these are preliminary results. Uh, Across the 13 IMWs that were, that were involved in this particular analysis, uh, the real focus was on three species, steelhead, chinook, and coho. There were some IMWs that looked at cutthroat and bull trout, a couple that looked at lamprey, but the three anadromous species at the top of this table on the left were the primary focal species of almost all the IMWs. There were a whole wide array of treatments that were applied across these 13 IMWs, but there were some that were very, very commonly applied. Right at the top of that list is the addition of large wood to the channel, either to increase habitat complexity in channel or to enhance lateral connectivity, connectivity between the, the uh, channel and the floodplain. Other common treatment types included removal of barriers. And that includes both removal of longitudinal barriers, essentially removing fish blockages, but also in many cases, the removal of artificial lateral barriers to off-channel habitats. And that would include things like the development of beaver dam analogs, the encouragement of beaver to bring up channel levels to, to enhance <clears throat> interaction between the channel and the floodplain, or in the case of the Skagit IMW, uh, the removal of levees and actions like that to provide fish with enhanced access to delta habitats. Uh, but those were all very common types of treatments. Next. Okay, quickly now going over the habitat responses. Now, these habitat metrics that are shown on this table represent the kinds of metrics that were measured across all 13 of these IMWs. Now, not every IMW measured each one of these metrics, but nonetheless, it does give us the ability to take a look at whether or not there were positive responses seen in these habitat metrics collectively across the, all the IMWs following the application of treatments. And, and in three quarters of the cases, 75% of the cases, there was some indication of a positive response in habitat condition following the application of treatments. Surprisingly, perhaps, in about a quarter of the cases, there was no change in habitat condition following the application of restoration treatments. Let's take a, a, little, a little closer look at, at this particular response. Next slide. <clears throat> As the habitat data indicated, that the response to these applica the application treatments was variable, but there were particular treatment types where the response was, was really quite highly variable and, and perhaps right at the top of that list was the addition of large wood. Now, in many IMWs, the uh, addition of large wood led to the kind of anticipated change in habitat condition. We saw increases in pools, we saw uh, increased sorting of material on the bed, the kinds of things that we put wood in stream channels to accomplish. But there were a large number of IMWs where this particular treatment type was not associated with any detectable change in habitat condition. 
And in fact, there was a very detailed analysis led by Kirk Kruger, Eric Ward, and a bunch of other folks last summer uh, looking at almost 20 years of annual habitat data across three Western Washington IMWs. And they were unable to find any strong indication of a trend in habitat condition, despite the fact that there was fairly aggressive restoration treatments applied across these three IMWs, which obviously raises the question of why. Well, Kirk et al. posited three possible reasons as to why we're not seeing a stronger signal uh, from restoration treatments. And, and one, which is particularly intriguing, I thought was that it may well be that habitat quality in many of our watersheds is continuing to decline. It is declining rapidly enough that application of restoration treatment simply isn't sufficient to, to change that trajectory. And this declining habitat quality in many cases may be the effect of past land uses or continuing uh, human land uses. Another thing that they found in this analysis was that many of the habitat attributes that we measure tend to be much, much more variable on an annual basis than I think many people had expected. Uh, they found high degrees of temporal variability in, in many of the habitat attributes that were included in the analysis. And it may well be that this high degree of variability through time makes it extremely difficult to actually separate out a signal associated with the application of rest restoration treatments from the noise caused by this, this vari natural variability in these particular conditions. And finally, the other possibility is that the wood that was added simply wasn't done correctly. It was put in the wrong place or it was undersized for the stream or it wasn't put in a particular configuration that would be optimal for achieving the desired habitat outcome. And again, we don't know which of these is actually true. Uh, but as <clears throat> Amelia pointed out uh, a few minutes ago, there is an effort that has just recently gotten underway to take a much more in-depth look, a meta-analysis across a series of IMWs, primarily in Western Washington, uh, to ask some of these kinds of questions. One of the questions that, that we will certainly investigate is why are we seeing this, this sort of variable response uh, in resp response to the application of wood treatments. Uh, and hopefully we can get a, a clearer indication from this analysis as to what types of characteristics are associated with wood placement projects that have a high probability of generating a positive fish response and habitat response. Next. Again, fish responses across the 13 IMWs, very much like the habitat table I showed a minute ago, these were the population metrics that were measured across the 13 IMWs. And across those, <clears throat> those uh, studies, about half of these fish, fish metrics showed an indication of a positive response to the application of treatments, uh, which to me was surprisingly low. This is essentially saying that we put a project on the ground and we got about a 50-50 chance, a coin flip, of actually generating a positive response in fish. Uh, go to the next one. We could look at this in a little more detail. Um, again, we saw this high degree of variability in fish response, but there was, in fact, some consistency if you took a look at response to individual treatment types. There was consistent positive fish responses associated with the correction of barriers, whether that was a longitudinal barrier that was preventing access of, of fish to upstream habitats or it was the removal of lateral barriers, uh, enabling uh, more consistent interaction between the channel and the floodplain. Uh, a good example of this was at Bridge Creek, where beaver dam analogs were used to bring up the water level in the channel and provide more consistent access to floodplain aquatic habitats. And a particularly good example of the removal of lateral barriers leading to a positive fish response was at the Skagit IMW. It was just an estuarian IMW, but there they removed dikes to a variety of other actions to enhance access of juvenile Chinook, Chinook fry uh, to delta habitats and saw a very strong positive response as a result of those actions. Um, but again, responses, fish responses in this case, the wood placement varied. There clearly were some IMWs that saw positive responses in fish metrics associated with wood placement. There were a whole lot, however, where there was no indication that the fish were responding to that, that particular type of treatment. Now, another strong message that came across in the synthesis was that many of the IMW scientists, and I think this is 
uh, it certainly is <coughs> is uh, well supported, felt that fish responses to the application of restoration treatments at their IMWs was being significantly impacted by out-of-basin factors, factors beyond their control, including things like impacts from hatchery practices, uh, fishing pressure, hydropower impacts, changes in ocean condition, climate change, a whole variety of factors that could be reducing the response of the fish to correction of, of uh, habitat deficiencies in freshwater or estuarine systems. So this really provides us with, I think, a, a pretty tall hurdle, but one we're ultimately gonna have to figure out how to deal with, and that is how do we account for these out of, out of basin factors when we're attempting to make a calculation of, of the kind of contribution watershed and estuary restoration can make to salmon recovery. Something that we haven't solved yet, but something that we can need to continue to work on. Next, I think that is my final slide. Yeah. Uh, any questions? I have a question. This is Matt Belknap with Idaho Fishing Game. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, I think, a couple slides back, um, your slide about the uh, fish response and only having a couple positive uh, or whatever, the coin flip, 50 percent chance of a positive response. Is that a 50 percent chance of a positive response or a 50 percent chance of actually measuring a fish response? Yeah, that, that's actually a good question. It's something I should have pointed out. The way that we assemble these tables, the way that we actually assemble the data for the synthesis is we sent out, as, as I think Amy indicated, a questionnaire. And when we asked uh, the, PI, or the PIs at the IMWs whether or not they were seeing a positive response, we didn't hold their feet to the fire of providing st statistical evidence that that, in fact, was occurring. Simply said, do you think you are seeing a positive response in distribution, smolt production, um, juvenile densities as a result of the application of treatments at your IMW. So this was a fairly low bar, at least statistically, in terms of, of, uh, of, of being counted as having a positive response. But even, even being that liberal in terms of definition of positive response, we still only got about 50 percent of, the, of the, uh, these particular population metrics showing a positive response to the application of various uh, habitat treatments. Thanks for clarifying. Appreciate that. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, are there any other questions about the anything that's been covered today or specifically about the results that Bob just covered. All right. Well, we're about a half hour in, so I don't I don't think it's oh wait, John. John's got a question. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Not a question so much as just a comment. Um, Megan did post the link to the uh, report there. I hope everyone gets a chance to to dig into that. I mean, there's a couple levels here. Um, you know, what we just shared was just a super quick brush over of, of the uh, highlights of the report. You know, within the report, it does talk a little bit more about the methods and what um, the definitions are of habitat response and fish response. Um, and then if you wanted to get into the data, you know, the, the previous question there about, you know, was it just not detectable or or was it not detected? Um, you know, I think you can get into that level of detail as you dig into the IMW snapshots section, which is in the appendix. And there's a link to um, individual IMWs that have, you know, stronger messages um, because they're individual IMW by IMW and not rolled up at a summary level. And there's there's lots of material uh, there as well. So hopefully um, folks dig into this just a little bit more. I know there, there were some fears out there as we developed these 
um, summary figures that, that folks wouldn't dig into it. Um, and really, you know, there's there's a lot of important information in there and, and a lot of nuance. Um, you know, and I guess there's there's been some um, some press on this uh, with varying perspectives and you know, I guess it, it just depends on on who you are, how you look at this data and these results. But, you know, a fish response in some cases, you know, no change or it is. Um, it can be interpreted in many ways as well. And time uh, was one of the things that we talked about during these workshops. You know, how much time has gone by? Do we expect to see uh, a change? And the life cycle of salmonids, you know, plays critically into this. And and so um, stay tuned on some of these as they might change as the IMWs progress and more information is gathered. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, John. <clears throat> um, we've got just a comment from Keith Dublonica for folks who can see the chat. Um, but if you can't, he's just reminding people of the upcoming salmon recovery conference uh, in April of 2023. Abstracts are due October 5th. Uh, they're anticipating monitoring sessions and an IMW specific session um, and lightning talks. Uh, stay tuned. And then Keith, I don't think you actually inserted the link. So if you want to throw the link into the chat, um, what, what's there now is not working for me. Uh, anybody else? Questions or comments? So at the end of August, I emailed uh, all of you a survey to help us understand what the priorities of the INW community are for future collaborative work. Uh, there were two sections to the survey. The first focused on future research opportunities, and the second section focused on the recommended management and policy actions uh, from the report. We're gonna go over the results from the survey in just a minute, but before we get there, I just wanted to say that, you know, to address every single one of the research opportunities and recommended actions uh, from the report would will, will, will or would take a tremendous amount of time and effort. And I don't want to go uh, into this conversation with the impression that PNAMP plans to facilitate working groups on each of them. Uh, I think some of the recommendations are going to be things that each of you individually can incorporate into your work and project planning. Some of them are gonna be best addressed by a small group of scientists. Some you know, might make a good topic for a conference symposium, uh, but we do think there are some that will be best advanced via some sort of you know, workshop with a large group of stakeholders. So those are just things to keep in mind um, as we discuss the survey results and think about priorities and how best to make progress on these research opportunities and recommended actions. So, <clears throat> just a little uh, bit of background before we get into the meat of it. So we received 47 responses to the survey uh, and we asked you to identify your role. And knowing that many of you wear more than one hat, we did allow you to select all roles that applied. And we can see that the majority of respondents fell into those top three roles. Uh, we also asked about the state that you primarily work in, and uh, we see that responses were pretty much dominated by folks working in Washington. So it's just good to, you know, kind of keep this in mind as we interpret the rest of the results. And I'm going to pass it over to Bob to talk about uh, the section of the survey covering future research opportunities. Yeah, okay, go. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> One of the uh, concluding sections of the synthesis highlighted uh, sort of research topics that were uncovered were exposed as a result of the synthesis effort. And then it was followed by a set of management recommendations that John's going to talk about in a minute. Uh, but these six these six research topics are the ones that we included in the in the questionnaire and asked you what you thought the relative importance was. And as you can see, you pretty much uniformly thought that that these topics were of some importance. Um, but that being said, go to the next one. Okay, go to the next one for me, if you will, Amy. And again, here's that, that same set of bars here showing the relative importance. And not only did you think these topics were important, but many of you did not feel that your current program was collecting data that was uh, 
that would contribute to answering that question. And many of you did not feel that that data was generally available from other sources. So that would suggest that, that not only are these questions important, they are clearly things that we don't have a full understanding of, of how they're impacting uh, our ability to restore, recover salmon populations. Now, that being said, <laughs> um, I don't know that these are the types of topics that we could make significant progress on through a PNAMP workshop. These are research topics, and, and in fact, there has been some progress made in addressing some of these questions already, and that's through a, a GSRO surfboard-sponsored project that is just getting underway, uh, essentially a meta-analysis, which is going to include the Western Washington IMWs, potentially uh, the Asotan, um, but the, the whole idea is to, number one, identify a set of key questions that we think we have the data to address, and we've done that. We have a set of six questions that we've identified, which actually overlap with these research opportunities from the synthesis quite closely. And it is our intent now to assemble teams, a bunch of the folks who are involved in this are on this call, to assemble teams and they will independently then uh, use the data that's collected at, that's been collected across these IMWs to attempt to cast a little additional light on these particular topics of, of, uh, of importance. But that being said, I think that is probably the best way to address these research uncertainties, although anyone who's engaged in salmon restoration in any way certainly can encourage people uh, to pay attention to these particular topics, either through supporting research on these topics or encouraging the development of technical sessions at scientific meetings to talk about these topics. Uh, but the, probably these topics are not the ones where we can have the, uh, the greatest effect through a PNAMP workshop. Rather, uh, we think that the PNAMP workshops probably ought to focus on the management recommendations that uh, John's going to talk about now. I think that's the last slide in this section, Amy. All right. Well, then why don't we move on to the, um, the recommended actions section of the survey? John, this is your up. Yeah, thanks, Amy. OK, so what are we looking at here? Um, so in the report, you know, we talked a little bit already about the core messages uh, for habitat and for fish response um, that Bob talked about. There were those six research, you know, current and future research priorities um, that Bob also just got done talking about. And those were identified through the workshop series with IMWPIs um, through the through the workshop group and what we heard there. Um, so so those were kind of vetted and developed um, as a team effort. However, the recommendation section here, which you're seeing the 10 recommendations from the report, was developed by our smaller group, um, Amelia, Bob, Amy, and myself, based upon what we heard um, during the workshops and in developing the report through the revision process. And, and this was us, you know, hey, this is what we're hearing. Here's some recommendations that we would make based upon what we heard. And these are just the, um, the summary bullets um, that you're seeing here. Each one of these has got kind of some supporting text that goes along with it. And I'd encourage you to, to grab the, the, the full report to look at those. But um, as part of the survey, we um, also included questions on this, you know, to what can we help advance? Um, are people already working on this? It, it was sort of a, a check for us on, is this, um, are we on the right track here? And the survey responses, I think, validated our recommendations in in many ways. You know, nothing's really jumping out at us here. I think uh, very few people that took the survey felt that that these items weren't a priority. All ten recommendations were identified as high priority actions um, at a relatively high level, and you can kind of see it in in different groupings here. So. You know, similar to the last question there, you know, is this a priority or not? Yes or no, blue being yes and no being red. And then the dark blue is yes, and folks are already working on this. So maybe that's a little less of a priority for us to work on. Um, maybe again, that's a uh, communication and, and connecting the dots conversation for us. The, the light blue, the medium light blue, 
uh, for lack of a better term, there is is probably the the top parties, and and we need to work on that. Folks aren't working on that, and we need to start this as soon as possible. Um, you know, so how are we going to do that? And so, if you can hit the next slide, Amy, you're going to just be looking at the same thing with the addition of who who is most appropriate based upon the survey respondents. You know, who do we think is the most appropriate stakeholder or group to be working on these items? And it was across the board. You know, almost all groups that we identified. So this is a team effort in many ways. Maybe some groups should take the lead on it. Um, we hope that that folks pick this up and move some of these things forward because as Amy said, we can't we can't do it all here as part of this group. Some of this stuff is moving forward um, and and being implemented or work on worked on. And some of these recommendations are reinforcing past and current efforts. And it's a simple matter of communicating these recommendations to the appropriate audiences as to what's needed. So just trying to elevate the conversations that many of us are already having. Some of these recommendations will be best addressed in uh, restoration and project planning efforts. I think, um, again, that goes in line with, you know, folks are, are already working on this. If you could just hit next, Amy, uh, we'll just highlight those, you know, recommendations one, two, three, and six, we think kind of fit into that vein. As, as folks update recovery plans or restoration work plans or, you know, individual project design and implementation efforts, you know, the, that's where these are going to be implemented. Um, if you can click next, Amy, please. The This next group is more of a funding and policy uh, level conversation, and, and we need to elevate this and are making sure that folks hear that, yeah, we do need um, stable long-term support for fish and habitat monitoring and support for restoration planning and permitting to accelerate implementation timeframes. Just really quick on these, you know, back to Ken's question, you know, what is moving forward? Is this uh, report done anything to help that? Um, I, I don't think either of these two recommendations are new, but it we have been able to help elevate uh, these conversations. Recommendation seven, at least in Washington, I know, um, this item has been included in the governor's uh, salmon recovery strategy, and so conversations are ongoing. You know, how do we how do we provide a stable long term funding source? Um, and now that that's in the work plan, it feels like that's that's the next step that needs to occur there. And the um, the permit issue, you know, streamlining permits. Um, again, I can only speak to Washington, but there are uh, meetings ongoing now with permitters. Um, and recovery and restoration practitioners to learn you know can we streamline or accelerate um for the permit process uh, for implementation time frame so that's exciting i know that's a long conversation um with with varying responsibilities there and, and legal ramifications but uh, that is moving forward and, and hopefully we'll get some updates on both of those in the near future and if you could hit the next button there, please. So these green boxes, recommendations four, five, eight, and ten, uh, were those that we felt like could be advanced through, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and in some cases maybe conferences or symposia. It, really, any of these can be addressed there, but more on the workshop or a focused team effort. Um, so these are the ones that we kind of self-selected as as this small team on items that we think hey maybe we can help um advance some of these with with our group and the group that we've been participating with um so these are the ones again we just self-selected and self-identified um, and would like to have a conversation with you all here in a second on priorities um, other recommendations but before we get there um we I did want to note again, we did receive interest from several folks and we'll plan to follow up from them from the survey responses in the near term um, on on interest in engaging on these, maybe potentially helping lead an effort on this. But we just wanted to, to ask again today if there was anyone interested in volunteering to help uh, flesh out any of these recommendations and lead or plan uh, some next steps uh, for anything here. So um, while folks are thinking about volunteering for that, um, 
I'll circle back around uh, and 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 ask that question again. But we wanted to ask if there were any additional ideas that folks would like to add to this list of recommendations, um, either new recommendations or even a sub bullet or something to consider under one of the existing recommendations. So I'll pause there. Uh, so two questions. Are there any volunteers to help lead and plan or flesh out um, moving forward any of these recommendations and two? Are there any additions to add to the recommendations themselves? Thanks everyone for all the great feedback uh, and discussion. We've got some great ideas. Uh, I think we've got a lot to sort of digest and um, connections to make, dots to connect. Um, but uh, by next week, um, we will share the full survey results. So today, you know, we just showed kind of a subset of it, but we want to make sure that everyone has access to the full survey results. So we'll get that out to you, um, as well as a short list of workshop ideas. So, um, yeah, so not everyone was able to be here today. So we didn't want to try to come to any sort of conclusion about, you know, what what sort of workshop or activity PNAMP might um, take up uh, going forward. Um, so instead, what we want to do is, again, send out a very short survey with um, a list of ideas. It'll be kind of the short list that, you know, uh, John, Amelia, Bob, and I came up with. And then we'll throw in some of the ideas that were discussed today. Um, and we'll ask you to rank those and, and think about our capacity to help move uh, one or two of those forward. Um, so uh, then over the next six weeks, uh, we'll be following up with anyone who offered to help either via the survey or during the call today. And then by the end of October, um, we should have some sort of plan for, you know, a PNAP, either a workshop or activity that we would uh, pursue. And then in January, uh, we're planning to share progress updates on all work being done on the reports, research opportunity topics, and recommended actions. So that's what we're promising to do between now and January. Uh, any Anything else from Bob, John, or Amelia that you want to add before we wrap up? I don't think so, I mean, just want to thank um, everyone again. Really appreciated all the inputs and the uh, workshop time that folks helped us put together the um, report on and glad that there's interest in participating to implement uh, the next steps and needs that we identified and, you know, those that will continue to come that we haven't identified. Thanks, John. All right. Anything else from Amelia or Bob? I think you've captured it all. Thank you. All right. Well, then um, I just want to thank everyone again for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate, again, all the input, um, hanging in for the two hour meeting, um, and we'll be in touch soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thanks.